use of transition metal oxides, supported on titania specifically, uh, for a commonly widely used reaction industry, SCR, but particularly focusing at lower temperatures. Now I know for most of you there's no need to put up this reaction in this room. However, um, basically SCR <coughs> is using a reductant, which is ammonia, in the presence of a catalyst to transfer nitric oxide into nitrogen and water. Um, typically in industry, this uh, reaction is operated at temperatures uh, above 330 degrees Celsius, so in the range of 330 to 400 degrees Celsius. And one of the important considerations in this reaction is that you want a highly active catalyst, but you also want to avoid the formation of this byproduct N2O. Um, it is expected that uh, selective catalytic reduction will receive uh, even more uh, widely, it will be used even more widely as uh, EPA regulations continue to tighten. Now, the purpose of the work that I'll be showing here today, uh, this is essentially uh, going through the, the startup of this project uh, for low temperature SCR. Uh, I'll speak to you about the catalyst development, our need and our, um, not, sorry, not our need, but our emphasis on staying with simple catalysts that could be scaled up and used in industry. So everything that we've made was used with nitro, was um, synthesized using nitrates of transition metal oxides. Um, our secondary goal was to develop this highly active catalyst, which has also had high nitrogen selectivity. And our particular goal, and what you'll see here today, is um, temperatures in the range of 180 degrees Celsius or above. And I would like to pause here for one second just to say, yes, there is an extremely low temperature. Um, you are going to form ammonium bisulfates, ammonium nitrates, ammonium nitrites at these temperatures. Um, the uh, application goal for our catalyst is at temperatures above 240 degrees Celsius. However, because of the um, high activity that we're getting, uh, in this uh, presentation I'm going to show you temperatures uh, in this range. Um, obviously time stability is important and a, a large amount of the presentation is going to focus on surface characterization of these catalysts uh, with an extensive amount of XPS looking at the concentration and oxidation states of different metals on the surface. Um, mechanistic studies are our next step and we're currently doing that in the lab right now. Uh, normally in a, in a, let's say, coal-fired coal, uh, power plant, there are three, sorry, that fit very well. There are normally three configurations of uh, SCR treatment. Um, the top two are, I'm not going to focus on today, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is the application that we're looking at is placing uh, the SCR reactor after uh, particulate matter has been removed and sulfur has been removed as well. Um, at this uh, location, the benefits are that you have obviously a much lower SO2 concentration, uh, therefore uh, delaying deactivation of the catalyst, and also much lower particulate concentration, also delaying uh, deactivation. However, normally uh, for coal-fired utility plants, you're talking about expending 5% of the coal that you normally feed into the plant just to reheat this flue gas stream uh, back up to temperatures of traditional medium temperature SCR catalysts. So, what's out there right now in the literature in terms of <coughs> low temperature uh, NOx removal? Um, industrially speaking, Shell has been developing a propri proprietary vanadium titanium catalyst, but they've also been doing some reaction engineering and have developed a lateral flow reactor which helps improve their contact. Um, Ron Polonk uses another proprietary uh, catalyst, um, this time supported on alumina. However, what you know is that both are still using the traditionally used medium temperature metal, which is vanadium pentoxide. Um, an interesting result uh, carried out by Richter dealing with zeolites, where he was using a periodic stepwise operation of ammonia loading. And this initially had some uh, promise because they wanted to look at uh, reducing ammonia slip. So they would send in ammonia at periodic steps that lasted 45 minutes, shut it off, turn it on, and they operated in a transient mode. And finally, and more recently, there's a substantial amount of work uh, coming out of, from a Chinese group from uh, Zhu et al., 
which is using vanadic pentoxide supported on activated carbon. Uh, however, one of the issues associated with their catalyst is that they need to activate and steam at 900 degrees Celsius and uh, treat it with concentrated nitric acid before it's allowed to go on stream to be effective. Now, getting into the catalyst that, that we have used, and I'm just going to draw your attention to a few catalysts here. Um, initially, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you that our best performing catalyst is manganese on a very high surface area titania. Uh, the surface area of this titania is over 300 meters squared per gram. <coughs> and um, we are um, able to maintain much of that surface area. Um, comparing the top three metals, say vanadium, chromium, and manganese, vanadium because it's what's traditionally used in medium temperature SCR. Um, we see that the metal dispersion for all of these catalysts is not very high. Um, the metal loading is, yes, it is very high in this case, even though the surface area of the catalyst is high. Um, however, our comparisons were chosen to be done at this weight percentage because of a slide that I'm not showing here, in which our highest um, activity was achieved over um, catalysts containing that high amount of weight percent, that high concentration of transition metal. Um, looking over to the, the total acidity of, the, of these three catalysts, we see that um, manganese, again, which is our best catalyst, has moderate acidity compared to chromium or vanadium. However, what's very interesting is when we looked at uh, using F ammonia adsorption, uh, ammonia FTIR, uh, vanadium, which is a known bronze acid site generator, um, which performed not very well, is in uh, direct it's the direct opposite of manganese. And what we're seeing is that there's hardly any bronze acid sites on manganese. So there's predominantly Lewis acid sites, um, which is um, in disagreement with the, the commonly held um, uh, medium temperature mechanism where bronze acid sites are known to occur, are known to be necessary. Uh, and additionally to that, just as a side note, we also looked at silica and alumina just to say the comparison of higher surface areas or higher acidities, but those supports did not perform as well as titania did. Starting with the catalytic results and initially screening first world transition metals, we're running at uh, much higher concentrations of ammonia and NO than what's typically seen in, let's say, the exit of a coal-fired plant, which would normally be around 400 parts per million. Um, this was done in order to uh, essentially help clarify uh, the differences in catalytic performance during the screening process. Um, the gas oil space velocity in this case, initially for the screening, was also low. Um, you'll see further results uh, in the talk at much higher gas oil space velocities. But this was done initially to stay comparable to what was reported in the literature. So moving on to our catalytic results, what we see is um, vanadium, which typically is a medium temperature. Uh, does not perform well. However, I'd like to point out that we're at temperatures as low as 100 and 120 degrees Celsius. And when you get down to temperatures these low, our, te our highest performing transition metals are chromium, manganese, and copper. Um, those three metals uh, I'd just like to help put in your head right now because we'll be talking a lot about them through the rest of the presentation. <coughs> Iron and cobalt didn't perform as well, and nickel, which is almost inactive, and that was believed to be the fact because it was, it's only confined to attaining one valence state. Now, if we go and look at the surface with XRD of these catalysts, first of all, what we notice is that uh, any oxides, transition metal oxides that are formed here, are relatively amorphous. It's very difficult to see by XRD, and it doesn't tell us uh, a whole lot of information. Um, chromium, vanadium, iron didn't show any uh, mixed oxide phases. Uh, however, from particularly looking at manganese, what we see is that from XRD we're only able to visualize the uh, formation of MnO2 peaks. Now, if we go to start looking at XPS in a little bit more a little bit more sensitivity. 
Let's so start sliding that up. What we're looking at here is deconvoluted XPS spectrum of the oxygen 1s peak. Uh, in the top one, which is chromium, which is chromium on titanium, what we see is that uh, the oxygen on the surface of this catalyst is coming mainly from titanium, which is what this peak is. The similar case is for nickel. However, when we go to our best performing catalyst, which is manganese on titanium, we see that the oxygen is now coming predominantly from manganese, suggesting that there's a very high concentration of manganese oxide on the surface of this catalyst. If we stay in XPS, and we then stay with manganese as well, and go to three different supports. Again, I'm showing manganese on titanium. We see we have a high concentration of that oxygen, because this is oxygen 1S, it's coming from manganese oxide. That corresponds very well with the manganese to titanium ratio of 6, which is achieved from XPS, just looking at the surface of metals, uh, surface of the surface metal concentration. Um, as we move down on gamma alumina, this difference uh, dissipates a little bit. And however, when we go to Aldrich, sorry, when we go to silica, we see a dramatic difference where uh, because of the interaction of manganese and silica, this sh this shift, uh, the peak of manganese shifts to this location. But what we see is that a, a ratio of manganese to silica of 0 0.8 corresponds very well with this deconvoluted oxygen 1s peak, where now the oxygen on the surface is coming from silica, mainly from the support. This trend holds similar if we go to different types of titaniums. Again, manganese and humica titania, we see this. This is maintained over uh, Chimera titania, which is a uh, titanium support, which is mainly rutile, which also uh, happened to perform almost as well as this high surface area humica titania, which consisted mainly of anatase. However, when we went to P25, which did not perform well, we see that the amount of oxygen on the surface is no longer coming. It is no longer coming from the transition metal oxide. It's not no longer coming from manganese. So when we have a decrease in catalytic performance, we're seeing a greater oxygen concentration from the support itself. So what does all of this tell us? This tells us that we most likely have a lot of manganese oxide present on the surface of this catalyst. And indeed, that is the case when we go look at titanium XPS spectrum. And what we see is that this holds for the other transition metals as well. But as we're moving down, these are titanium peaks. And specifically, what I would like to emphasize is that when we go to our, our manganese titania catalyst, we're hardly able to resolve any of the titanium peaks at all. So that provides some pretty substantial proof that manganese is covering a lot of those surface, a substantial amount of the surface of titanium. So after we've shown that, uh, more specifically, we'd like to look at uh, what exactly is going with the manganese that is on the surface of this catalyst. And here we have a comparison of, now we're looking at the XPS of manganese 2P. And in the top XPS spectrum, what we have is 28% manganese on Havica titania. And we see from this deconvoluted peak, we, th we see three separate contributions. One is coming from manganese uh, O2, MnO2, which is a substantial peak. A second one from Mn203, which is a, a minor peak. And a third one, which we believe is due to manganese nitrate. Now, manganese, manganese homicot titania performs very well. And even though it's been calcined at 400 degrees Celsius, we're still seeing a large concentration of manganese nitrate still on the surface. Um, normally we wouldn't think that would be a good idea to have something on the surface still covering your active sites, um, but I'll get back to that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, what I would like to point out to you is different in the lower <coughs> figure here, is that we no longer have MnO2 as our major manganese oxide species. In this case it's Mn203. And when we go to look at the catalytic performance of this particular catalyst, it's substantially lower than humicot titanium. Therefore, we believe that 
MnO2 is the active um, component, the active oxide of manganese in this catalytic system. Now, when I was speaking about the manganese nitrate before, we were very interested to see what was going to happen with that. So what we did was we took that catalyst, did not calcine it, put it in the reactor, and started up, ran it at a normal reaction where this was run at 120 degrees Celsius. And what we saw was that after a period of about 20 hours time on stream, it did nothing initially. But even at temperatures as low as 120 degrees Celsius, we were able to remove enough of this manganese nitrate to expose enough of the active sites on the surface to achieve the original catalytic characters, uh, catalytic activity of this catalyst uh, as if it had been calcined. Switching gears a little bit and going to look at the acidity of these catalysts, particularly these transition metals. What we see here on the top are our top three performing transition metals. Uh, vanadium is shown for comparison. We see the very uh, obvious bronson acid peak that is known to occur when vanadium is present in the catalyst. Uh, however, what we see is something very interesting here is that both um, uh, chromium and copper have some uh, Lewis acidity with bronxite acidity. It's very minor in copper, but it is there. However, when you go to manganese, bronxite acidity is completely absent. It's lacking bronxite acidity. So this offers strong support that the mechanism that normally occurs at medium temperatures, which requires bronxite acid sites, uh, it's not the same mechanism when we're operating at lower temperatures. Of course, when you're running in an industrial setting, you're going to have to worry about things such as water and SO2 and other things like that. Again, when we take our best performing catalyst, 28% uh, manganese on top of titanium again, starting with the open circles, what we have is that at a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius, um, as we increase the water concentration, we can go all the way up to 10 volume percent water and still maintain above 85% NO conversion in this case. Um, this, I should have pointed out early at the beginning too that as well, because of the low temperatures that are studied here, all of our byproducts, uh, sorry, all of our NO is going to nitrogen. We are not seeing any N2O formation in any of these catalysts at these temperatures. And going back to our open triangles, if we run at a constant 1.7 volume percent water, just by bumping the temperature up about 40 degrees to about 160, we can get back up to 100% NO conversion. None of those tests were at saturation, though, right? It's, it's water, the gas is not saturated with water. Um, sorry, did you say it one more time, please? The gas, like say at the lower temperature, the very low percent of water that's not saturated with water. That, oh, like, no, it's not. In a scrubber, right? Yeah, correct. No, it's not. Um, we haven't gone outside of water concentrations out of these, so I, um, in case of is it a problem, we haven't seen it and haven't particularly explored that to see whether it would be. Um, so with these results that we've seen, um, the next thing that we did is to try to combine some of these good performing transition metals that we had to see what would happen um, as um, most catalysis people like to do is to form you know, binary phases. What's going to happen if we put these metals together? And what happened was something that was quite unexpected for us. Um, on the bottom, what we have on the left-hand side are is a titanium support. This is a very high surface area. This is just another titanium support for comparison. We see our good performance of chromium, manganese, and copper. However, when we start combining some of these best performing metals, we see that in both cases, manganese copper and manganese chromium has, offers lower performance than the sole um, transition metal present. Um, in this case, 
you know, you're talking about 20 weight percent of metal, this is 10 weight percent manganese, 10 weight percent copper. So keeping the total transistor metal oxide weight loading constant. Even on this uh, support, we see a similar effect. Both manganese chromium and manganese copper are uh, performing much more poorly than when manganese is present by itself. And what I would like you to remember from this is that manganese copper, as opposed to manganese chromium, is, is better performing in both of these cases. So when we put manganese and copper together, we get better performance than manganese chromium. Um, when we went to look at the surface of these catalysts using XRD, Uh, again, we still had the similar resolution problem because of the amorphous nature of these catalysts, transition metal oxides. But what we did see was very interesting, was the formation of these binary metal oxide species, such as copper 1.4 and then uh, oxygen 4 shown by these stars, and also by the triangles that are pointing down, oops, sorry, pointing down, I'm thinking improperly. So uh, we didn't just get a, a simple uh, addition or combination of each of these contribu contributions from separate transition oxides. We started forming completely different species. Now that isn't very conclusive in itself, but when you go and perform XPS on these samples, we observed a very interesting trend. And here we're just looking at the, the atomic concentrations of these transition metals on the surface of the catalyst. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is here, on this first catalyst, which is 15 weight percent manganese, 5 weight percent copper on titania. What we see is that um, the ratio of manganese to copper here, looking at that, we see that we have more manganese than copper on the surface. Manganese, copper, titanium was a better performing bimetallic catalyst than manganese chromium. If we up the concentration of manganese a little higher, uh, you can argue these are approximately the same, but we have slightly more copper, but we have comparable metal concentrations on the surface. However, when you look at chromium instead of copper and you combine these two metals, what we have is substantially more chromium on the surface of manganese. Um, what that suggests is that when we combine chromium, we're, have, we're covering some of the manganese on the surface, which is thereby uh, leading to decreased catalytic performance. So we're, we believe that uh, having manganese exposed on the surface is very essential to the operation of these catalysts. Um, this, actually this is seen even higher here when you compare uh, 10 weight percent manganese and copper or 10 weight percent manganese and chromium, this time on the other titanium support. When it's copper, you have slightly more manganese than copper. However, when in the case of chromium, we have almost two times more, two and a half times more chromium present on the surface for equal weight compositions of the transition metals. Looking at the acidity of these catalysts when we do combine these transition metals, starting with A and B, which are just the uh, monometallic catalysts, A being manganese, B being chromium, we see that we get a uh, substantial increase in the total amount of Bronsted, sorry, Bronsted and Lewis acidity of these catalysts. However, this simple increase in acidity is not enough to have good performance, good catalytic performance. So um, uh, the acidity of this catalyst is not um, believed to be an essential part of its SCR performance. A similar trend can be seen looking at the ammonia TPD spectra for these catalysts. When looking at the bottom of the figure, when we have chromium and manganese, we have arguably similar uh, areas under these peaks. And we com when we combine manganese and chromium, there's not a substantial difference. It's a slight increase in the area, which would correspond to a slight increase in the acidity, total acidity of this catalyst. However, when we combine manganese and copper, we have a substantial boost in the amount of acidity of this catalyst. 
However, that's not corresponding to any substantial increase in catalytic performance. Looking at the reducibility of these species for these bimetallic catalysts, um, we see two very minor chromium peaks at 305 and 425 degrees Celsius with a substantial one for manganese at 375 and some minor ones at 425 and 490. And particularly, copper is very easily reduced. It has a very low temperature reduction peak. Now, when we combine manganese and copper, we, we practically lose the uh, almost all identity in terms of reducibilities of manganese features in the spectrum. And we see a peak that comes out corresponding to copper. Uh, similarly, when you increase, sorry, when you decrease the copper content, even though there's more manganese in this, on this catalyst than copper, we see that its uh, reducibility pattern is still corresponding to that of copper. So copper is dominating this catalyst, even though it's present in lower concentrations than manganese. Um, when we get manganese chromium, we see that the reducibility is um, uh, corresponding more to chromium, and there's nothing very interesting. So, with everything like that's been said here today, um, I would like to conclude by saying that our best performing catalyst, which was 20 weight percent manganese on Hambicot Titania, was able to, I'm sorry, was able to achieve 100% anode conversion and 100% nitrogen selectivities at temperatures as low as 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, in the presence of water, we're able to get good performance at temperatures above 160 degrees Celsius. Um, our best performing metals, which were manganese, copper, and chromium, when present as single transition metals, um, they, those were the catalysts, those were the transition metals that minimized the initial, uh, that minimized the surface area loss that was present on the initial support on, after impregnation. Um, lower calcination temperatures, um, something that I didn't very, really touch on in here, but we, when we calcine at temperatures of 300 and 400 degrees Celsius, that's all that we need to ensure a good performing catalyst. When we go to higher temperatures, our activity drops off dramatically. Even though we're leaving manganese nitrate present on the surface, it's not affecting catalytic performance. Um, the possibility of the nitrate species contributing to SCR has been ruled out, so we're not talking about nitrate chemistry. And we believe that redox metals, those capable of going through oxidation reduction cycles, um, which is why nickel performs so poorly in this case, because it's confined to one oxidation state, are needed along with having a high concentration of MnO2, particularly, on the surface of this catalyst, uh, in order to achieve good, t good activity at lower temperatures. Uh, XRD showed the relatively high amorphous nature of the transition metals deposited on these catalysts, and the, um, the peaks of these transition metals are amorphous regardless of the surface area of the support used. Um, from the initial table that I showed you early on, a very high metal dispersion is not necessarily required to have good catalytic performance in this case. Um, our XPS data showed that we only had partial decomposition of the manganese nitrate precursors. Uh, it's still sitting there, but we want MnO2 as our good phase. Finally, bronze acidity is not required for good performance. And while bimetallic transition metal catalysts do give us more acid sites, which are of higher strength, they don't necessarily give us better catalytic performance. And finally, I would like to acknowledge financial support from the Alcohol Development Office, and particularly uh, Mr. Dale Canary and Stan Vecchi for discussions with us. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. The system you used actually is a feature of using 20% uh, loading of metals in your uh, titanium. Um, uh, I'm thinking, have you, you know, uh, studied different loading? Yes. I'm, 
I see that during the form manganese, it's shown that the, the physical performance is showing 20%. I don't know if you used many uh, other, you know, loading for other uh, metals like copper or uh, other system to maximize the, you know, the performance. Um, if I understand you correctly, are you asking, have we varied the, the weight percent of different metals to, let's say, optimize that's right. the catalytic performance? Um, initially, that's the next phase of the work is the parametric study. Initially, uh, we did do it for manganese, and which I didn't have a peak, but you did a gradual increase and then a plateau once you get to 20 weight percent manganese oxide on that homicot titanium support. Um, other metals were not run under that type of test because they were not performing as well. Um, it will be done in the next phase of that study, but we were more interested with developing this catalyst and more, in a sense, understanding uh, why manganese was so much better than all these other transition metals at these lower temperatures. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, if you are going to replace the standard catalyst right now in SCR, you will have to run at higher temperature because you can't move the unit around. How stable is this at higher temperature? Um, at higher temperatures, under the current composition, uh, you're going to lose nitrogen selectivity. So for this current catalyst formulation, you would have to modify that significantly, dramatically lower the composition of manganese present in the catalyst if you wanted to move this. So you have to re-optimize for different temperature, you lower the manganese concentration. Yes, yeah, you, you essentially have to go through the, a different, <coughs> excuse me, a different optimization. Yes. Two questions. Okay, so the manganese is not very stable above 400 degrees centigrade. But what about the carbon catalyst? Above? 400 degrees centigrade. Okay, uh, SCR performance? Right. I mean, what about its stability, its thermal stability? You said the manganese titanium, if you calcine it above 400 degrees centigrade. Yes. You lose performance significantly. Okay. Because of the change in oxidation state of manganese. But what about the copper oxide titanium system? Do you see the same thing? Okay. Uh, we have not carried out the same calcination study for copper oxide, so I can't give you direct data in terms of that. Um, however, um, one of the reasons I believe that we're seeing manganese, um, a decrease in uh, catalytic performance when on the manganese catalyst, besides the, the change in formation of the, the manganese oxide species forming MN203, as opposed to MnO2. Um, manganese is also known to be a uh, promoter of the phase transition from anaphase to rutile. And that is seen in the dispersion values when we go to higher temperatures. Um, I don't, copper should not have the same effect okay. as being a transi phase transition promoter. One other question. Have you looked at uh, manganese supported on other types of refractory? Uh, we have done alumina and silica, and the performance at these temperatures is not as, as good as on these titanium supports. Um, the surface areas of those ca um, supports were somewhere around 560 square meters meter square per gram for silica. Alumina was about 230 meters square per gram. Thank you. It seems, as you pointed out, that really that redox ability is the key here for manganese, for for the catalyst. So manganese, obviously, is uh, so um, manganese and not copper, for example, is a lot more useful to be ideal to have this available copper oxidation state all the time. So go from plus four to six or seven easily. So it seems that the heat of formation of the oxide might be I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, we haven't done that yet, and I, I think it's a very good idea. I haven't looked at it yet. The other thing is the um, um, the TPR that you show was with respect to hydrogen. Yes. And you show this uh, 375 P for uh, manganese. Obviously, here you are working at 100 to 120 or maybe that's your range. 
So have you thought or have you tried doing it with uh, ammonia? some more information. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, the X-ray diffraction indicates that you have some bulk crystalline oxide component uh, at these loading levels. Um, and also you just mentioned that you saw the activity uh, go up as you went up and loading up to 20%. Okay. Do you have a good idea of uh, what actually is the uh, active and selective site in this case? Is it the uh, essentially molecular species that dispersed at, disperse at the surface, or do you get the maximum of activity and selectivity when you get these uh, you know, oxide phases that you see in XRD? And can you, can you kind of deconvolute that complex picture that you probably have on the surface? Uh, are you sure that what you see is related to uh, the bulk phases, not to uh, uh, you know, this, the two-dimensional uh, layer that's also exists on the surface of the same conditions? Um, are you referring to the, bi the case of the bimetallics, or oh, only when I ramped up the death manganese? Both cases. Both cases. Okay. Um, well, um, when we're ramping up manganese, definitely we're not going to see any other binary phase um, metallic oxides um, on the surface of the catalyst. Um, 